how did you find out that the victim was leaving town the following day? Uh, I can't remember that good. Was it from a blog? Objection, Your Honor. Leading. It's not leading, Your Honor. Was it from a blog? Yes, ma'am. Okay, what blog was that? The blog was Wendy. No. Do you want the culpable parties held accountable for murdering the father of your children? Absolutely. I'm grateful they're already in jail. But not if it's your family. It's not my family. I mean, somebody hired them, right? Not necessarily. Somebody paid them. I learned something this morning. <laughs> yeah, me too. You didn't want them held accountable if it was your family members. Didn't you tell law enforcement that? That's not what I told law enforcement. What did you tell law enforcement? I told them that the person who did this should be held responsible and that I had nothing to do with it. Page 122, lines 7 through 12. If somebody tried to kill my ex-husband, they should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. The investigator says, regardless of who it is, and your answer is, I mean, it would be different if I thought it were my brother. But I don't think it was my family. That's what different I now, isn't it? No, it's not different. That's exactly it's different what today, I said right it? here. No, that's not no right. No further questions. You are listening to the Roberta Glass True Crime Report, putting the true back in true crime. From New York City, Roberta Glass is now on the record. Okay, how is everyone? Boy, am I excited to, to talk to you today. In addition to a pretty interesting subject and one that has been talked about since I've been following this case, which is why is Wendy's demeanor on the stand so weird? What's going on? What's up with the head tilted to the side, eyes wide open, mouth a little bit open, doe-eyed look on the stand? What is this all about? What is she doing? It's not something that we see often in trials. Someone with such a strong affectation. But today I am going to play for you pretty interesting video from a psychiatry resident. So it's, and he's going to look, he has some ideas. It's some of the same things that I've noticed. And when I was going to the Nexium hearings and the Nexium trial, meaning Keith Ranieri, the Nexium's guru leader's trial, he is doing a 120 year sentence now, thankfully. So, but before I get into that, I want to thank, I have been having so much fun all day. I want to thank Aussie Dude for sending me a birthday present. I've been like a child all day, my own gavel. <laughs> I've been like like a, a two-year-old all day, <laughs> Hammer, hammering nothing, order in the court. <laughs> my boyfriend's, I hear him yelling from the other room. You having fun with that? I am having fun with that. Thank you so much, Aussie dude, for the birthday gift. My own, my very own gavel. What more could you want? Put me in a good mood. Um, let's get into your questions. Or our comments, really. So last time we were talking about, what were we talking about? Donna, I think. But a lot of comments about about Wendy too. So 
Gaga, north of the 49th, 62, says, what sheltered grandmother would call back a stranger who is harassing her to reason with him? She would have picked up the pol- she would have picked up the police immediately. She would have picked up, I mean, picked up and called the police. I think that's what you mean immediately and had them come to see her to start an investigation or put a complaint in. Exactly. Instead, she's saying, I'll call you back. <laughs> that's how that call ends. So I was pointing out. Hold on. I'm a little too enthusiastic and maybe a little too loud here. I was pointing out how that really is going to be the cornerstone has to be of their defense, Donna's defense, Donna Adelson's defense. Her call with the undercover from the bump where she says, I don't know anything, but it's so opposite how an innocent person would react i don't think she quite sold it i don't think she quite had the effect she was intending donna evilson donna evilson says all because of narcissistic personality disorder donna and charlie more so charlie just couldn't keep off the phone he had to pick his mom's brain on who called. Wendy just had to go to the crime scene. She had to feel the rush. She couldn't wait. She just had to know. This will sink Wendy and Donna in the end. Yeah, Donna, Donna Evelson, what you're really talking about in your comment is their need to control things. So part of Having control is having all the information. So you'll see that in Donna's arrest video, too. She wants to know exactly where she's going, what the next steps are, what she can expect to maintain control. But Wendy, really, I was looking at, Wendy really couldn't help herself. And it's a terrible I think it's the thing, it's a terrible thing for her, a bad fact for her that she drove by the crime scene. For me, I found it very hard to believe she didn't know anything or wasn't involved from that very bad fact in this case. And you can hear Charlie on the wiretap. I was listening to Charlie's. You know, when you're listening to YouTube and, and it just turns over, you have, you know, it turns over to another video. So I was washing the dishes and that video came on. I was listening to Charlie Adelson's cross-examination and he's, he's arguing in it that Wendy just drove by the wrong way. There's nothing incriminating about it. And then cut to, there's a great video to be made. Here. Hey, Murder by Maestro. Hey, the Society page. Hey, it's Miss Lisa on my favorite channels. Then cut to his jailhouse tapes where he's bemoaning, why did Wendy drive by the crime scene? So in cross-examination, he's saying, oh, there's nothing unusual about it. She just was on her way to buy bullet bourbon for her stock the bar party, and she just happened to take that route. Cut to the jailhouse tapes and there he is talking to his mother saying any reasonable person would say she had to know she wouldn't drive by that way by accident but on cross-examination he takes great offense it's really funny kathy barella 4304 says hey roberta what is up with wendy all this talk in her head, but not for her mother. I can't believe with all the education she's had, she can't strike up a conversation with her mom. She certainly has enough friends to come to her rescue. Very true, Kathy. I think the murder kill all trust in this family. I'm not sure what you mean by that last line, <laughs> but yeah, I was with you all the way up to the end there. I think the I think what you mean is that 
they all trusted each other to stay silent in this family. And that, I mean, how many families I, I imagine do this kind of thing together? I know there's one other case like this, but it's not people of the same class, certainly. And they did it themselves in, in Ohio. Arthur Dunn 622 says, good video and lots of information. I'm a bit worried, though, because I'm sort of getting tired of this talk about Donna and Wendy and their personalities. Hmm. So I think what Arthur is saying, though, it doesn't really describe it very well or go on keeps it brief thank you arthur is that he's afraid that it looks like maybe this is what i'm getting from this comment that we are basing our feelings of guilt on their personalities but i i would argue it's all it's all intricately connected the whole backstory of the family and their personalities are intimately connected to their guilt. I would, you know, I'm working on a episode about the Russ shooting and I'm returning to that. I've done a couple videos on that. And because the armorer is coming to trial, but really about Alec Baldwin and making that same kind of argument that his behavior, past behavior, and even his marriage is all can be seen in context of that crime or that accidental accidental crime, whatever you want to call it. All right. Shall we get into Wendy? So this is a channel I'd never seen before. And thank you to the person who put it up on, I think, Reddit in the murder of Dan Markell Reddit. So thank you for bringing this video to my attention and hold on let me just it's andrew van der vart and he says he's a psychiatry resident and he asks is wendy trying to hypnotize us so before i get into this what he's talking about is some of it in this is neurolinguistic programming and this is a technique that was used in nexium the Number two in Nexium was a woman named Nancy Salzman. And she's apparently number two a lot because she called herself the number two neurolinguistic programming expert in the world. I don't know how you would even, <laughs> even, even categorize yourself as such, but I don't know how that label if she just bestowed it upon herself or what. But I can say that she is very good at that. When when it came to her sentencing, she began her comments to the court. And by the end of it, I was totally zoned out and felt bizarre. And I kept saying to people afterward, didn't you feel like her statement was very odd? Wasn't it, wasn't Nancy Salzman's statement to the court very odd? I went home and I slept for two days. So I, I don't know what, what she did exactly. All I can say, it's a style of communicating. It started out to help people overcome their own personal difficulties like stuttering, but it is more commonly known as a style of communicating meant to persuade so a lot of salesmen were, would use it and have a way to have undue influence on someone. Another way I've heard neurolinguistic programming described as painting pictures with words, trying to create positive feelings around whatever, whatever idea you're trying to sell or thing you're trying to sell someone on. So I hope I, hope I made that clear. You can kind of go back if you're... But he had some things to say about Wendy's demeanor. Let's take a listen. Oh, Wendy Adelson's behavior and speech patterns on the stand. What strikes me about it is what appears to be the subtle use of hypnosis techniques, in particular pacing and leading and mirroring. You remember sitting outside on the patio? I do. 
and it was you and Mr. Lacoste and Charlie and a woman named Catherine. Mac so one thing we'll see her do frequently is this kind of almost trance-like stare, slowly moving her head around mm -hmm. and these slow blinks. And to me, this looks like if you, if you want to induce a sort of suggestible state in someone, right? This, this is what hypnosis says. If you want to induce a suggestible trance-like state, you need to first mirror the words or behaviors of your subject and then try to start setting the pace yourself. And so what, what this kind of slow staring and slow blinking in particular looks like to me is trying to slow down the pace, try to actually induce a trance by going into a semi-trance-like state yourself if you find that your conversation partner is suggestible, you'll find that they'll also slow down and go into this trance. And your goal is a suggestible state that comes with being this sort of relaxed, slowed down, you know, suggestible state, right? So the way I've heard hypnosis described is if you've ever been driving and you're thinking about something else, and you missed your exit. So it's like you're that sort of that state where where what you're thinking about becomes more, I, I guess, becomes so the your reality becomes secondary to what's going on in your head. I think that's a good way. Daydreaming is another way uh, uh, of of describing it. So what he's saying is she's moving her head in a way to get you in a rhythm that's a little bit trance-like. And obviously she knows her brother is very guilty. And I guess she's trying to pull out whatever she can to convince the jury that <laughs> that that she's not involved in this and that her and that her brother wasn't involved in this either. After dinner, you and uh, Jeff Lacoste um, stayed at Charlie's house, right? We did. After dinner, you and uh, Jeff Lacoste. You can see the how slow um, those blinks stayed at are. Charlie's house, right? We did. I don't really remember if I was nervous around him, but I started thinking it wasn't the right relationship. Every time Charlie's wearing this outfit, it always reminds, it always looks to me, and I don't know if it's just a light colored shirt, but I look at him and for a second, I think he's wearing a tux. And I always think the maestro in my, <laughs> in my head with this outfit he wore one day in court. It's very light. It just his hair kind of, kind of pushed back. It looks very much, very much like the maestro like he's going to conduct an or orchestra or something. He started accusing you of being unfaithful, right? He did. He accused you of having an affair with someone that you had previously dated. He did. <clears throat> Excuse me. You told him that you didn't. You denied it. That's right. And he didn't believe you. He did not. Before this individual that you used to date, you had coffee with at a place called All Saints in Tallahassee, right? I did. And Mr. Lacoste saw you having coffee with this individual, right? He did. And that caused a confrontation. Is this where I started to pick up this bad habit of calling Jeffrey Lacasse, Lacoste, Lacoste, so from watching all this, all this footage? I don't know. But I always think about this coffee date that she knew he would be there and she needed more. They're very scheming, these Adelsons. She needed more. <laughs> very always happy to set people up. And he was supposed to be the fall guy. So she had to prove that he was horribly jealous. So she set up another date when he's suspected her of having affairs. And he was right. I love that. I love that she's like, well, yeah, I couldn't deal with him. He was just thought I was having an affair. Yeah, he was right, rightfully. So kind of funny. So, 
Yeah, I think she set this up on purpose. That if I had to guess, I I can't I can't know though. Not, and none of us can ever know really for sure, unless we're Wendy or someone in her inner circle. She told. Is that fair to say? He flew into a rage. He basically exploded at you. He did. He yelled at you for hours. He did. He accused you of having affairs with multiple people. He did. Uh, you were very upset, to say the least. I was devastated. Yeah. She was devastated. I was devastated that my Patsy boyfriend was upset about the affairs I was having. It's Miss Lisa. Love this new content to analyze and dissect. Great find, Roberta. Thanks. Thanks so much. And thank really thank the people at Reddit who found who brought this to my attention. <laughs> it's but thank you, Miss Lisa. It's kind of interesting. I think a lot of people had brought up this idea of hypnosis, but this is the first visit video where the, anyone brave enough to say, is Wendy trying to hypnotize us? So. so there's also repetition and mirroring in her speech patterns. So the way she answers questions most often is, he did, or I did, or I did not. And so part of that is just the pure repetition of it, he basically exploded at you. He did. He yelled at you for hours. He did. He accused you of having affairs with multiple people. He did. So the, the repetition part is another form of pacing. The same way you can use your mannerisms to slow down the pace. You can use repetition to kind of induce an inertia. Giving different sorts of answers kind of creates this, you know, back and forth sort of dynamic uh, that keeps people kind of alert. But if you give just the same answer over and over again, that alertness might go down as people are getting used to the kind of momentum or inertia of the conversation. And again, that can promote a kind of trance-like suggestible state. Now, I'm not saying she's trying to literally induce a trance, but she's trying to perhaps induce a minor form of a trance-like state that is essentially heightened suggestibility. I don't know if Wendy Adelson has ever formally trained in hypnosis. Yeah, but a lot of people who train in public speaking, in sales tactics, persuasion tactics, all those things are very necessary if you want to be, not sales tactics so much, but persuasion techniques, public speaking techniques, they're all used by people who use neurolinguistic programming. And I would think Wendy would have some experience or want some experience. Pretty much every famous politician that you can think of has at one time studied neurolinguistic program or is using it. So it, it's pretty interesting if you go on the wikipedia so i was having a discussion with my boyfriend before this episode and, and he was saying well can you describe neurolinguistic programming meaning he's very literal and it's pretty amorphous <laughs> and hard to hard to describe hard to describe because also it's had many incarnations depending on what it started out really as a, a personal growth thing and then really has rooted in our culture as a persuasion technique. And one that is very criticized because ultimately what you're having is undue influence o over someone. They don't know you're, if you're using it without someone knowing you're using it, I think most people would consider that it, not ethical. So what he's talking about here with the rhythm, it's almost like you can hear between Rashbaum and Wendy. It's like a, as if anyone's watched tennis, it's like that volley back and forth of the ball, but now they're doing it. Uh, now they're doing it with question and answer. But oftentimes people that are formally trained in persuasion will know some of these techniques because there's a significant overlap between the literature on persuasion and the literature that is more in the niche of hypnosis. You know, if you look at Robert Cialdini, who wrote Persuasion, and then Scott Adams, who's 
talked about the relationship between hypnosis and persuasion outright. I would suggest that being a you know high powered attorney as Wendy Adelson is and has been would make it reasonably likely that she was familiar with persuasion techniques. And so that those persuasion techniques are maybe where she's getting this hypnotic kind of practice. You went down to South Florida on June 30th and you and the boys stayed with your parents, right? We did. You had the boys with you the whole time? Yes. Dan Markell didn't have the boys at that point in time. The boys were with you. Yes. And Charlie knew that, right? Yes, he was with us. So what I think she she must be aiming for is for the jury to get listening to the rhythm of the conversation and not the content of what she's saying. That would be, I would think, the purpose of this, using this technique. If she's using it, this is, of course, none of us can know for sure. We're not Wendy. We're not in her inner circle. We, we can't know. So Charlie Adelson also does the slow blinks. So I don't know if that's possibly this is just something that is almost a genetic tendency to just have these sorts of slow blinks. I would argue that Charlie Adelson's blinks are very different than a slow blink. They're, they're, how, how, how do you say this? Like <laughs> very uh, jerky blinks, not slow, s slow. How do you say this? Uh, feminine, <laughs> slow, feminine, gentle blinks. They're, everybody knows Charlie's weird blinking. It's almost like Robert. It's almost like ticky blinks, like jerky blinks. I wouldn't call them slow. I wouldn't include it as, as I wouldn't include it in the same category as Wendy's slow, grace, graceful. That's the word I was looking for, graceful blinks. Or perhaps they're unconsciously colluding and trying to create a suggestible state in the courtroom. Um, or they're, they're responding to each other's pacing, maybe by these nonverbal cues. Um, uh, I don't know. I, I know this is kind of an out there theory, but... I couldn't help but notice when I was watching this testimony, there, there's something kind of bizarre about it, right? About her state. When you got back to Tallahassee, you saw Mr. Lacoste on July 13th? Yeah, what he's responding to is he knows he's going to get a certain amount of people in the audience who are going to say, stop picking on Wendy. It doesn't mean anything that she testifies in this way that 99% of the people go, huh, what's she doing? This is very odd. There's going to be the 1% of people who say, I didn't notice anything weird about it. So what if it's all weird? It doesn't mean anything. They're the same kind of people <laughs> who will tell you certain testimony doesn't mean anything or Wendy driving by the crime scene doesn't mean anything. or I drove by a, <laughs> a crime scene once kind of normalizing weird weirdness. There's always, there's always that crew and a crew in the YouTube audience for sure. That sounds right. And um, when you saw him, it was not a good meeting. Is that fair to say? It's uncomfortable. Yeah. Just to catch you up on what they're talking about. So, Dan Markle was murdered in 2014. The members of the Latin Kings gang that actually carried out the murder have already been prosecuted and are incarcerated. At the time of the murder, Wendy Adelson and the victim, Dan Markle, had been in an extremely acrimonious divorce for several years. And at the time of the murder, Wendy Adelson was dating someone named Jeffrey Lacoste. So that's what they're talking about. When they're talking about Mr. Lacoste, they're talking about her relationship with this new boyfriend post-divorce with Dan Markell, who was murdered. Now, Jeffrey Lacoste has since claimed that Wendy Adelson had talked to him about Charlie, her brother, Charlie Adelson's 
plot to hire a hitman to kill her ex-husband, Dan. So it's in Wendy Adelson's interest now to make claims that that boyfriend, Lacoste, had some anger issues, bitterness, flew into a rage at one point. She needs to undermine Lacoste's testimony about this conversation of a hit. So that's sort of the context of what they're talking about right now, but I'm more interested in analyzing the behavior and speech patterns for this video. You saw him the next day at a yoga studio? I went to yoga and he wanted to come. And uh, it was awkward? It was. And kind of tense? It was. And he asked to see you again later that week? He did. And you didn't want to? I did not. And so there you go. So that re repetition again, or that style of answering questions, it's like, it was awkward, it was. He didn't blah, he didn't. So, so this is the mirroring part. So you had before you had the repetition of I did, I did. Now you have a mirroring where the attorney uses a certain verb, like it was blank, and she says it was. So she's now mirroring the attorney by just repeating those same basic verbs. It was, I did. And again, in hypnosis, the reason for mirroring is you first want to be mirroring the subject and then you start testing whether you can lead them. So it's like first you're mirroring and then you give these little tests to see if you can take the lead. And once you have the lead and you see them mirroring, then you know you've achieved your suggestible state. You never saw him again, right? Right, so it is a challenge. It, what, what he just described, I, are you guys paying attention? So pretty interesting stuff. So what he's saying is that if she can mirror Rashbaum, she can lead him, she can get him into a suggestible state and lead him where she wants to go next. So, which is really kind of, what interests me about Rashbaum's cross of, of Wendy here in the little bit that we've just seen is it so on message with Wendy being the victim? So did he yell at you for hours? He did. Did he berate you about your alleged infidelity? He did. Was it, then he followed me to yoga. I was going to yoga and he, and he wanted to come. <laughs> As if Wendy had no say. I couldn't, I couldn't keep this incredibly out of his mind, incredibly jealous, out of his mind with possessiveness and jealousy, soon to be ex-boyfriend away from my yoga studio. He was, he was clawing to get in there. That's what you say. <laughs> I couldn't stop him. He, he's, he, so she's, she's partially, she's insinuating he's a stalker. Let's just call it, let's just say it Say it how it is. She, she's insinuating he's a stalker. Right. No. So, okay, that's interesting too. So you never saw him again, right? She says, no. So at that point, she abandons her usual pattern of saying, I did, it was, I did not. You know, that time she doesn't say, I did not. She says, no. Now, Remember, she's she's a lawyer, right? So you have to think she knows what she's doing this whole time. You know, she's definitely quite intelligent. I don't know if she is as intelligent as she believes she is, but I can't deny I think she's very intelligent. But so why would she only say no that time? Theoretically, Wendy is very intelligent. She graduated magnum cum laude from Brandeis, valedictorian from a class. My daughter, th there's no one more intelligent than my daughter. If you don't see that my daughter's intelligent, you're stupid. You're stupid. By the way, are you Jewish? Do you need a date? Glee, her saying no there could be, it could be, no, I never saw him again. Or it could be, no, that's not right. Because the attorney said, you never saw him again, right? She says, no. So she's giving herself the possibility of answering a question without answering the question. Um, you know, I don't know if in this case 
She's saying it because she doesn't want to admit that she saw him again. So she's giving herself this out of just saying no, rather than being more precise and saying, I did not see him again. It's just that that kind of strategy I'm suggesting might be the kind of thing she's capable of doing because she... No, I did not see him again because unfortunately he left for his trip early and was totally useless to me as a patsy. So that's when I had to get on my phone and look for a new jealous ex to blame my family's murder conspiracy on. Uh, yeah, not, <laughs> not for, n not for, for nothing though, but, <laughs> but what is, uh, <laughs> Never mind, never mind, never mind, never mind. Just what would have happened to, that's where my mind goes, what would have happened to Jeffrey Lacasse had he gone on his trip when he said he was going to go on his trip? That That is, and I think that was what Wendy was really fantasizing about, is he would have come out and said, to everyone, and I've done episodes on this, to everyone, well, Wendy told me that her brother looked into hiring a hitman last year. He would have looked like a crazy person for a little while, certainly. And I think that she got tremendous pleasure out of that. She knows sort of the the lines around perjury, and she knows that she has plausible deniability in this case to say, oh, it, well, I was saying, no, that's not right. I, if, if it comes out that she saw him again, right? Let's listen to that again. And uh, it was awkward. It was. And kind of tense. It was. And he asked to see you again later that week. He did. And you didn't want to. I did not. You never saw him again, right? No. No, that's not right. Or no, I never saw him again. You and the kids by Professor Markell's house in the afternoon or morning of July 17, 2014, correct? It would be some other woman and some other kids. So there, instead of answering that question directly, which would have been correct, right? So the question was, if someone saw you at your now murdered ex-husband's house on July 17th, which would have been the day before the murders, that couldn't have been you, correct? And she says it would have been some other woman and some other kids. So this to me is- It's a very weak denial. And I wonder what really is the truth behind this. Some people say it's not possible. She couldn't have been there, but we know she had a habit of picking up the kids when it wasn't her day or wasn't her time or early, and that was one of the problems between, Dan Markell did not care for that. So it, it, her weak denial doesn't help sell me on the idea that it was a case of mistaken identity. When Sigfredo Garcia pointed Wendy and her kids out to Luis Rivera. Sort of an attempt at leading Rather than merely answering the question, she's now trying to implant a suggestion of it was someone else, right? Which is sort of, it, it's proposing information that no one else has brought up. What they've brought up is there was witness testimony that it's her. She's now saying that was some other woman and some other kids. It must have been. So she's trying to make this suggestion is what I'm saying, rather than merely saying it wasn't me or that's correct. It was some... It, I wasn't there. I was, usually we hear people say, I wasn't there. I was here. It couldn't have been me. I don't know what they, what they saw. I don't know what Luis Rivera saw. I do not know what Sigredo Garcia saw. But instead, she's very happy to give an explanation that she couldn't possibly know. This is what they saw. They saw another woman with other kids. But there's other possibilities. They made up that story. That story is a cover for something else. <laughs> she, 
she doesn't know. She can't know. But she's saying with absolute certainty that it was a case of mistaken identity. They saw me here and not there. And they remembered it wrong. There's another, there's another possibility. Someone else. The person would be wrong if they said that they saw you and the kids by Professor Markell's house in the afternoon or morning of July 17, 2014, correct? It would be some other woman and some other kids. And again, holding that kind of trance-like facial expression. I want to talk a little bit more about July 18th. Um, so the day of the murder. Do you recall leaving your house that day on Aqua Ridge Ray around? You know, another thing that's not brought up in this is substances. We know that Charlie certainly liked to use benzodiazepines. And Katie sometimes, remember that testimony, got into them. So I think in an attempt, if Charlie thought he was going to get acquitted and he would still have his medical license, and I think it's the clock is ticking on that being taken away from him, certainly after his murder conviction. So he says, instead of saying, I gave Katie a pill, he's going to say she took it. She, she went into my stuff and took it herself. So that would get him out of any kind of issue with basically giving, giving out controlled substances like their candy is not a good look for a periodontist. 12.30 in the afternoon. I do. And you were going to meet a friend for lunch. So my point is how much of this affect is brought to us by say Pfizer <laughs> or some other big big pharma company, I, I, and the reason why I'm even rejecting the theory I just proposed is because I would think a lot of people would take these things to take that kind of medication to testify, and Wendy is one of the only people we've seen testify or only person I've seen testify in this manner. Let me know if you know of someone else who's ever testified in this kind of style. And not only has she just testified once in Charlie's trial, every time she testifies, it's this weird, whether it's in Katie McBanawa's and Sigfredo Garcia's trial or Katie's retrial. Every time she takes a stand, it's bizarre. And she's, testifying under immunity. So why the nerves? Okay, she's in front of the whole world. I get it. But she's no stranger to public speaking. Excuse me, I had a cough. So she just had to get up and, and talk, say the truth. Why, why the nerves? I get it. She's in front of the whole world. But I would argue that she's so nervous because Anything that she says that implicates anyone in her family also implicates herself. And yes, she's protected somewhat. She's protected totally about anything that she testifies. But her image can't take it. Do you know what I mean? You don't want to get the community that follows this case any more whipped up for your arrest than they already are. Believe me, we're all ready for Wendy's arrest. Will it ever happen? I hope so. I hope so. And we know that Georgia says she's holding on to evidence we haven't seen yet. What is it? Anyone, it's anyone's guess. A place called Mosaic. Yes. But you had to pick up a body bottle of, I don't know if it's bourbon or whiskey. I don't even know if they're the same things, but. Interesting Freudian slip there by the attorney. You had to pick up a body. bullet that's a favorite moment dan rashbaum so he's talking about bullet bourbon he's talking just he's talking about wendy driving by the crime scene and he talks about moving a body great little moment hey pretty peachy pretty peachy 
Great name. You've become a member. Welcome aboard. Slice of banana bread for you. Thank you so much. Usually I do not like body body language <laughs> videos. It, as you know, anyone remember Janine Driver and her palms up? Wendy's palms were up, so she's innocent. Remember that terrible fail? I'm I I genuinely gen generally, excuse me, don't get a lot out of body language, but I thought this was really very interesting little video. Whiskey. It was um, bourbon. Okay. Um, wow, and bullet whiskey. I mean, th these are just interesting verbal coincidences. I mean, the fact that he accidentally says body and the fact that it's bullet whiskey. It was for your friend's uh, wedding shower that night. So just interesting. So Rashbaum is bringing up all the things that are very odd in this case. Wendy drove by the crime scene. Wendy picked out bullet bourbon, but it was really, I think, believe bullet rye whiskey. So she didn't even pick out the thing that she said she was going to or she was asked to pick up. Let me just show you. I think I still have it up here. Let me just show you really quickly for those that don't know what I'm talking about. So this is from Daniel Savoy. This is a tweet to me, tweet. I think I got Wendy. And I talked to a guy there because I don't really buy much alcohol. So they wanted bourbon. And I asked the guy, we had a whole conversation about bourbon. And then she buys, and you can see here, rye whiskey. But I, I, the stock the bar party invite, here's the bottom of it. Here's the top of it. So right here on the left, for those of you who are listening on podcast, it asks that you pick up bur bullet bourbon or some other kind of spirit. And I don't know if that was changed for each person, but otherwise you would think you would come up, say if you invited 50 people, 40 of them would have bought bullet bourbon. You would have had a, a bar almost entirely made up of bullet bourbon if that were the invite that everybody got. So it's just this, this invite has never been verified and it just remains a big question mark in, in this case. So we don't know if this is the real thing, if it was made up by someone in the Adelson family or someone who is following this case, who wanted the clicks, I have no idea. So another mystery. Maybe it will be finally resolved at Wendy's trial, fingers crossed. Almost tragic irony. So a Freudian slip with body and then it's bullet whiskey. I mean, just strange kind of coincidences there. I don't, I don't, I'm not ascribing any meaning to that. That's just, uh, they were having a stock the bar party. So they, um, they asked for specific kinds of alcohol to stock the bar. I mean, if you, if you really want to ascribe the kind of worst possible motive to her buying bullet bourbon or bullet whiskey, you could wonder if it was a kind of in joke with herself that she got this bullet brand and brought it to this party. Um, but, uh, you know, again, I think it's a reach. Well, you can think it's a, a, a reach, but you, we also don't know. We know the party. Let's go back to the invite. I'm sorry. One more time, guys. I hope I'm not boring you. But we know that it takes took place between 6.30 and 8.30. We know Wendy has small kids. We've never heard if she arranged for babysitters so that if she never didn't arrange for babysitters how, you know how did she how did she think uh how, she never calls off the babysitter i think it is not a reach to say did wendy buy this 
bullet bourbon, knowing she wasn't going to attend this party so that she could have something to celebrate when the deed was done. Knowing this family, it is not a reach. <laughs> when you know how how they operate, her owl shirt is another odd thing. It, it's a reach if you want to totally base your feelings of Wendy's guilt on the bullet bourbon or her owl shirt. It's just another interesting factoid that's very odd in this. But driving by the crime scene, and she has many different reasons why. One is one is that she has a bad sense of direction and she needed to go a route that she knew. Another one is that she drove by the house often as a way of coming to terms with the divorce. So she was coming to terms with the divorce once again that morning. And her reaction to it is even, even stranger, not to get out, not to ask what's going on. The realtor just heard about it and called her. But Wendy doesn't have any curiosity about what's going on, nor any worry. And it's... It's interesting. The lack of curiosity is very telling. The only one that had any curiosity about who did this was Robert, the eldest. He kept asking, don't you want to know what happened to Dan? Doesn't anyone in this family want to know? And they were all disinterested. Why? Because they already knew. That could be one, I think, very rational conclusion. And that was the conclusion that he made. And then estranged himself from from the rest of the family and your lunch was in, interrupted by investigator isom who told you that something had happened that's right you went with him voluntarily to speak with him you let the police search your car yes you were interviewed with uh the investigator Glenda K, thanks so much. Rashi, I love that. Rashi made point made a point that he and Wendy had not spoken before he examined, cross-examined Wendy. So how does he know her exact story to feed her on the stand, including how she felt at each juncture? Well, I, I think if I'm Rashbaum, I would say. Well, I watched her other testimony. It was televised, and I knew what she was going to say from that. But I think what you're picking up on, Glenda, is how rehearsed it feels. It really feels like they're putting on a performance with Wendy as an actress with memorized lines. It doesn't feel like, but except for Rashbaum's accidentally saying body, everything is coming out in a way that feels like he know, she knows the questions that are coming and he knows the answers that are coming. So, yeah, very odd. It feels like they, and we know how close Rashbaum is with this family. He was Harvey and Donna's lawyer before he became Charlie's lawyer and then now is representing Donna with Alec Morris. So very close with this Adelson family. In, in fact, I would say once again, he's enmeshed in this family in the same way these children are enmeshed, meaning Wendy and Charlie are enmeshed with their parents, Harvey and Donna. It's like he's he's the, <laughs> the long lost Adelson. It's like Rashbaum is the long lost Adelson family member or something. It's very odd. Investigator from two for, approximately 2.45 p.m. until 7.50 p.m.? Yes. He told you that your ex-husband had been shot and was unlikely to survive, right? Yes. You were in shock? Yes. You were pretty open with police, telling them a lot of things, right? They kept telling me they needed my help, and so I kept trying to help. Now... You remember on direct, Ms. Kappelman asked you about this interview. Yes. And she asked you about all the people you mentioned during the interview, including Charlie. Yes. And you said I was just wheeling off names, right? Yes. In fact, isn't the first person in the interview that you mentioned was yourself? Yes. 
you said that you would understand if you were viewed as the prime suspect, right? Yes. Before you mentioned anyone else, you mentioned yourself. Yes. You told them about the motion to relocate. I did. You told them about the fight you had with Professor Markell that very morning about some swimming for the boys. Yes. So, okay, I think Wendy Adelson listing herself or naming herself as the first person of interest or saying that probably I would be the primary suspect because if anyone has a reason to kill him, I'm in an acrimonious divorce. I'm the ex-wife. You know, I think this could be seen as a kind of persuasive honesty. You know, she understands criminal investigation. So on the one hand, even if she weren't in an extremely acrimonious divorce, she's the, the ex, right? So often suspicion goes there by default, but also she's saying, I'm going to be forthright about the fact that we've been embattled here. And, and so, you know, I, I'm not surprised that she would list herself first, almost regardless of her involvement. You know, I, I think the attorney seems to be sort of highlighting this, but I, I could see that part going either way. In my opinion, the thing that actually implicates her most is not the fact that she said I would be a reasonable person of interest when the investigators asked. It's that what she's referencing there, the uh, relocation dispute, was about Dan Markell essentially barring her from moving the kids down to Miami, where Wendy Adelson's family is primarily in Miami or South Florida. That's where her parents are. The whole family wanted the kids to move down there. Dan Markell is up in North Florida. He, he believed it would be unfair for this relocation to happen. And so he, he went through the courts to prevent Wendy Adelson from moving down to South Florida. He also went through the courts to bar unsupervised visits between Wendy Adelson's parents and his kids, their kids, uh, because of demeaning or degrading statements that Wendy Adelson's parents, especially Donna, her mom, I never said that. I never said anything. It was a stupid motion. You shouldn't even be talking about it, honey. It was nothing. No one was worried about it. Everyone was very relaxed about the proposition of my daughter, my wonderful, wonderful daughter, Wendy, possibly losing a license or me, Donna, having to get supervised visitations with my wonderful, very smart grandchildren. This is a stupid video, a stupid, stupid video. Oh, here we go again. It's all it's all the Adelson's fault. This is what I can imagine Donna saying. Um, we're making about Dan Markell to the kids. So essentially telling the kids your father's no good, uh, maybe in, in meaner language than that. So there's this intrafamilial dispute, but what I think is the most implicating to Wendy Adelson is the fact that it wasn't even 48 hours after the murder that she did in fact relocate to South Florida. But I think- Yeah, and also it wasn't even 48 hours before she's calling about how she can benefit financially, calling about, about Dan, <laughs> about, about possibly being on some of Dan's uh, accounts that she she would be a beneficiary of that's very damning and driving by the crime scene right after it happened even charlie agrees with me so it's kind of interesting to note that charlie disagrees with the maker of this video he finds the bullet bourbon and the fact that wendy drove by the crime scene both significant and that a reasonable, rational person would conclude that Wendy had foreknowledge of this co uh, murder conspiracy of her ex-husband, Dan Markell, before it happened. Barb Nauman, you are now a member. Fantastic. Welcome aboard. I think the, the bigger question that I'm sort of wondering, having watched this video and, and seen her kind of power of influence, or at least that which she seems to project as this persuasive hypnotic power over people, you have to wonder, you know, with her family dynamics, there seems to be a degree of enmeshment 
baked in to the family dynamics from what I can tell. You know, is it possible that she actually never said anything outright about wanting her ex-husband killed? A certain amount of enmeshment. Is, if that's not the understatement of the year, I don't know what is. There's a certain amount. There seems to be. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but this family seems like there's just a certain amount of enmeshment. Yeah, <laughs> try try a ridiculous, ridiculously enmeshed family. Have you read the? I don't think this guy has read the emails because they are intense. Is the is the word that comes to mind? Donna has looked into things. She's got plans for Wendy. She has strategies. She has acts for Wendy to put on. Encouraging her to be an actress, changing the kids' religion, getting them baptized. Talking to Charlie about getting him to convince Wendy to date Dave to really get serious about dating him where she's dating him, but she's not serious enough. She doesn't appreciate him enough and no one will want her because she's rapidly aging. I mean, the way they make her sound, <laughs> I mean, it's, you wouldn't know how, what a, she is a very attractive woman, but the way they, they make her sound like an old maid, not to date myself. Old. She merely, was relaying the information, perhaps in a certain way, that conveyed the life or death kind of urgency of her situation. And then her family, perhaps accustomed to doing whatever Wendy Adelson wants at all costs, took these drastic measures. Now, some caveats. Wendy Adelson is not even on trial at this point because there's no outright evidence that she was involved in the planning or execution of this hit. Charlie Adelson is on trial because there is evidence of his involvement via his girlfriend, Catherine, and her relationship to the actual hitman. But Charlie Adelson is also innocent until proven guilty. I'm essentially saying if it is true that there was this Adelson... Well, he's not... He's not innocent until proven guilty anymore. He's been proven guilty now in a court of law. Uh, just for those of you asking who this guy is, he's not, I, he has an MD and a PhD. So he describes himself in his about section of his YouTube channel. This is Andrew Vander Vart as a psychiatry expert, uh, a psychiatry resident expert. What am I talking about? But I thought it was interesting that he was talking about the hypnosis and the neurolinguistic programming aspect, possible aspect of Wendy's testimony. I, of course, have not investigated his background, but it was a little bit more interesting to me than let's look at Wendy's baseline and eyes to the left or those kind of things that, you know, those million rules of body language that seem to be tossed around and, and, and modified. So, for example, we looked at Janine Driver, who's a body language expert. And by the way, I, I, I went into her background. She is, I would say, not very, not very forthright about her background, which is with the not in body language so much, but she worked for the alcohol, firearms, tobacco, those people. And she gave one talk to the FBI. So she calls herself FBI trained and all this crazy. Anyway, but she said that Wendy's palms were up. So she's being honest. Then you go to the behavioral panel, their YouTube channel. They said Wendy's palms up, me, uh, indication of deception. So it, it changes upon these rules change depending on who's 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 telling them family conspiracy to murder Dan Markell. What does it mean if Wendy Adelson persuaded it without ever saying it? So that to me is an interesting. 
this guy seems to be a best case scenario. So what he's saying is, is she persuaded? Wait, is that what he's saying? Is it what he's saying? What I think he's saying? What I hear him saying is that perhaps she said something to her parents and then or her family and they did it without her knowledge. Is that what he's saying? Or is he saying she persuade she uses persuasion on the stand? Hold on. Let's listen. Let's listen a little further. Good question and a reason that I'm sort of just curious to be following this case right now. I don't have more time to dig more into this at the moment. I'm curious to be Wendy Adelson persuaded her than Markel. What does it mean if Wendy Adelson persuaded it without ever saying it? So that to me is an interesting question and a reason that I'm sort of just curious to be following this case right now. I don't have more time to dig more into this at the moment, but I appreciate your attention as always. Often my goal is to sort of come at these cases from an angle that I haven't seen other people do. And so that's that's just my current take on the mannerisms, speech and behavior of Wendy Adelson, uh, but I will continue to follow along. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So he was saying what I thought he was saying. So she said it. She said something that persuaded her family to take action. I, I'm, I'm not buying that, um, as you know. And the reason I'm not buying that, thanks, Barb Nauman, a meshed family with a hugely dominant psychopathic gene. Yeah, that's what I think too, Barb. Run while you can. Yeah, isn't it like marrying into this family? Isn't it like a horror movie? the unknown they look so perfect on the outside and then you get into the who they really are except for of course we're not talking about robert the eldest son whenever i talk about the adelsons I, i'm never talking about robert but what a creepy thing and isn't it interesting that this guy wanted to talk about who he's a psychiatry resident or he says he is I'm not saying he's not. I just don't know. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't researched myself. Isn't it interesting that he didn't take a, a more psychological approach and talk about Wendy's character or Charlie's character? Pretty interesting. I'm glad. I'm glad he he made that video though. I thought it was pretty interesting, and. I learned a lot about neurolinguistic programming when I was covering Keith Ranieri's trial and all the Nexium hearings when before all the other defendants like Allison Mack and Lauren Salzman pled out Nancy Salzman. All the, there's a ton of defendants in the early days. And many of uh, Tony Natale who dated Keith Ranieri and then was stalked by the cult, she feels that neurolinguistic programming, the people that were really susceptible to hypnosis, those are the people that stayed in, in Nexium. So it, I, I would think that, you know, if you go to, let me just show you really quickly. If you go to Wikipedia, and I am not the biggest fan of Wikipedia. I think anyone who studies court cases from the transcripts or goes to trials and then looks at the depiction of those cases in Wikipedia would not be such a big fan. But sometimes it's good just to get a date or some other piece of information. But the way they describe neurolinguistic programming is it's a pseudoscientific approach to communication, personal development, and psychotherapy that first appeared in Richard Bandler and Jonathan Grinder's 1975 book, The Structure of Magic. And so they keep referring to it as a pseudoscience, but I, I don't know what happened to me at Nancy Salzman's hearing but the way she was talking, the only way I can describe it is as somewhat is a as like the language was like a snake eating its own tail. Like 
it never went anywhere. The story she would she went all the way back to her childhood, but it never moved forward. Like the story never really moved forward, just kept winding on itself. Very, very strange. So I would think my point is I would think that this would have real that its persuasive techniques have to work in some way sometimes <laughs> or else I, I don't know why is everyone using it why is it persisted over the years or maybe if you're a politician you just or a salesperson you go for these things that really aren't effective I don't know uh, my feeling is I, I do think it can work uh, out of desperation I guess that would be the counter argument there all right, I'm going to take a tiny bit of a break, 30-second break. When I come back, one of the victim impact statements written for Dan Markell. Stay tuned. If you are enjoying this episode of My True Crime Report, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and share this episode. Get access to exclusive podcasts and other bonus content by becoming a patron today. If you have a question or comment for me, shoot me a super chat and I'll do my best to answer it and read it on air. Thanks so much. Now back to the show. So I hear that Carl Steinbeck is coming up with a new episode that I assume at eight o'clock Eastern. Is that when it is? I, if, if you're on that live, come, I'll be in the, I'm, I'm usually in the chat. I really like Carl's channel. Say hi. But what I wanted to ask you guys is who tuned into the society pages? Society page is having a contest to collaborate with him. I just wondered, 8 p.m. Eastern. So, yeah, Carl Steinbeck is going live 8 p.m. Eastern. Say hi to me if you see me over there. How many people are, I'm wondering how many people are have ideas for that or thinking about participating in, in, in that curious, Oh wait, I, sh I just shared the wrong thing. My apologies. Hold on one second. I'm a little bit, a little bit too excited. That news was too exciting. <laughs> Lost my head. So this is a more recent victim impact statement, and we know that because it was written October 22nd, 2023, and it was written for Charlie Adelson's trial. Dear Judge Wheeler, we attended Harvard Law School with Dan Markell over 20 years ago. If it were not for him, we might not have gotten married to each other. We he brought us back together after we had split apart and we have stayed together ever since now blessed with two children bringing people together was only one of danny's many mitzvahs good deeds as we are sure you will be reading about from friends family and colleagues he regularly called and emailed us and took the time to visit us in person, even after we moved cross country to California. His murder was shocking and something we still think about a lot. Even after so many years, he was a most memorable schoolmate and loving friend and the least deserving of a deliberate, calculated death. Below are pictures of the three of us celebrate, celebrating excuse me, Ted's 26th birthday during law school in the fall of 2000, when Ted was joking about turning 62 instead of 26. Dan will never enjoy another birthday. 
In fact, last year, he also missed his eldest son, Benjamin's bar mitzvah, a major religious and cultural milestone that would have meant so much to him. As we celebrated our own child's bat mitzvah last year, we thought to ourselves, Dan would have loved to celebrate our milestone with us too. So here you can see these are, maybe I'll try to make it maybe a little bigger, Xerox pictures. So they, it's hard to really, hard to see them, but you'll get a little bit of the idea. An additional note from Giselle. I was newly pregnant with our second child when I heard the news of Dan's death in July of 2014. It hit me so hard that I was shaking and sobbing off and on for months. I grieved privately so that our older child, then age five, born within months of Dan and Wendy's older son, Benjamin, would not see me crying because I knew that I couldn't even begin to explain what had happened. How do you explain a murder like this to a five-year-old? I would hide and cry, hide and cry. I would try not to think about it. Then it would come back and hit me. I sometimes worried that the intense grief would cause a miscarriage. I was terribly sick with nausea during the pregnancy. And to this day, whenever I think about Dan's death, I am hit by the same waves of nausea. We will never have Dan's loving, smiling face back. So all we can hope for now is justice. Sincerely, Giselle and Ted Chandler. That's what I have for today, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Please hit the thumbs up. Leave me a comment. Subscribe to the channel. Follow me on social media. I'm on X at Roberta Glass Pod. Join my Facebook group. The Roberta Glass True Crime Report. Or you can join the Georgia Kappelman Appreciation Society. Until next time, see you at 6 p.m. Eastern tomorrow. Have a great night, everybody.